Um, my name is Lindsay Dryden. Welcome to this special conversation between the co-directors of Quip Camp, Nicole Newnham and Jim LeBrett, presented by Sheffield Dockfest. Uh, we're going to get started in a moment. A couple of bits of housekeeping first. We have live captioning available provided by Inga Nesbach, and you can find the info about accessing that live captioning in the chat. Um, we'll also have some time for questions at the end, so please put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat. So let's get started. Um, a special thanks to Netflix, Higher Ground and Sheffield Docfest for making this event possible today. So first I'm going to introduce you to our guests, Nicole Newnham and Jim LeBrett, who should hopefully appear on screen. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so. Nicole Newnham is an Emmy winning documentary producer and director, Sundance Film Festival alumna and five time Emmy nominee. She's produced two virtual reality films with Lynette Woolworth, which have won the 2017 Emmy for outstanding new approaches to documentary, featured at the World Economic Forum in Davos and played at Sundance. She co-directed The Revolutionary Optimists, winner of the Sundance Hilton Sustainability Award, and she instigated, co-produced and directed the acclaimed documentary the Rape of Europa, which was nominated for a WGA award and shortlisted for the Academy Award. With Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Brian Lanker, she also produced They Drew Fire. Jim Lebrecht is a filmmaker, a film and theatre sound designer and mixer, author and disability rights activist with over 40 years of experience. Jim began his career in theatre, working as the resident sound designer at the Berkeley Repertory Theatre for 10 years. And his film credits include The Island President, The Waiting Room, The Kill Team, Audrey and Daisy, Unrest, and of course, Quick Camp. Jim's work as an activist began in high school and has continued ever since. And he's a board member of the Disability Education and Defence Fund, which works for the rights of the disabled through education, legislation, and litigation. Jim is honored to be a member of the Disability Futures Fellowship, an initiative of the Ford Foundation and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Lindsay Dryden. I'm a director, producer, and one of the co-founders of Forward Doc, Filmmakers with Disabilities, and I'm the founder of Little by Little Films. I'm going to give my image description now for people who are blind or low vision. So I'm a white woman in my 30s. I've got long dark hair and blue eyes. I'm lit a little bit gothically this evening, which wasn't intentional. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm wearing a black dress with buttons down the front. Um, <laughs> behind me is a very messy room in an old cottage uh, with cream walls and flowers behind me, uh, lots of colourful blankets on the furniture and some friendly chaos from working at home the last few months. Nicole and Jim, will you give us your image descriptions and your pronouns? Sure, I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, I am a 50-ish year old white woman with a blondish brown shoulder length hair and I'm wearing a black t-shirt and a um, gray and black polka dot um, cardigan sweater. And I have uh, round glasses, um, which I bought because they look just like Judy Humans in uh, one of my favorite scenes in Crip Camp. And, um, and I'm sitting in a, a bungalow in Oakland, California. Hi, I'm Jim Lebrecht. I am a 64-year-old um, uh, white guy with a very white goatee and um, uh, black rimmed glasses. And I've got uh, um, some, you know, uh, yeah, my hair is looking like the Lebowski today and um, uh, nice and curly. Um, I, uh, I'm in my home office in Oakland, California, the unceded land of the Ohlone people. And behind me is a wall, a red wall with some posters on it. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, just thank you again for being with us today. It's such a, pr a privilege and a pleasure to have you, especially in the UK. Um, it's really exciting. We're all in the same time zone. It's very exciting. Um, you know, your careers, but both of you, your ethos as filmmakers, your ethos as people, as collaborators, and this particular film that you've made together, Crip Camp, are really huge inspirations for, for very many of us in the documentary field. So it's, it's just a privilege to, you know, get the chance for everybody to join in this conversation. So let's get talking about the film and your journey. And we'll start by watching the film trailer. Let's have that clip, please. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, if we were in person, we'd all be cheering and clapping. Um, but in the quiet of this space, let's, um, 
let's sort of start at the beginning. Um, Jim, can you talk about your journey from sound design and you know into directing, co-directing with Nicole and what that process has been like? Because obviously you've been involved, you know, as an incredible storyteller and a significant creative contributor to films and theatre for years before you began working together. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, well, I, I, I've been really, for the last 25 years or so, have been um, uh, working in documentary film as a sound mixer, sound designer. I had a, had a small post-production company in Berkeley and I had the, the, you know, the pleasure and this amazing opportunity to work with some great, great filmmakers and uh, on their documentaries. The documentary community in, in, in Berkeley and in Northern California is really extraordinary. Um, and one of those people uh, is Nicole. And um, uh, about 20 years ago, I, I worked on the first film of three that I've been, I, I mixed for her, um, Sentenced Home. And, um, and so over the years, we became friends. And, you know, and my journey here is that I've seen a lot of incredible documentaries, but I had never quite seen something that I felt really, uh, really delved really deeply into the disabled experience, the experience of people with disabilities that really hadn't been told by us. Um, so, oh gosh, it's almost six years ago now, uh, Nicole and I uh, got together after she was wrapping up her last film, The Revolutionary Optimist, and I was pitching ideas that I would hope that maybe she would like to make films about of uh, different disability subjects. Like, you know, I think there's a story here about, you know, the uh, siblings of, of people, you know, of, of disabled, you know, uh, folks. And, uh, and when, as we're traveling back to the, um, uh, out of the restaurant, back to the parking lot, I said, he'd sheepishly kind of, you know, I actually, I, I've always wanted to see a documentary about my summer camp. And that I think there's a story there that ties into the disability rights movement. And what did Nicole say, Nicole? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was really um, engaged in the, um, in the conversation and, and, you know, was excited to be talking about this with Jim because for, you know, for, for years, um, Jim had been opening my eyes and the eyes of um, a lot of us in the documentary community to um, the lack of representation um, around the disabled experience, but also the lack of accessibility for filmmakers with disabilities in, in our community. And so the idea of kind of partnering up with Jim to tell a story was very um, intriguing to me. And, um, and, and when he said that about his summer camp, I felt two things. One is like, oh, I'm curious why he's saying that, but two is like, oh God, I hope this isn't that sort of like, you know, I went to this amazing summer camp and it changed my life kind of thing that a lot of people have, you know, because a lot of people have really powerful summer camp memories, but not everybody's summer camp needs to be a film. And um, and when Jim started describing Jeanette to me and this idea that he had for a story, it, it really blew my mind because I realized that I had no kind of mental map um, for this image of a kind of wild hippie utopia of campers and counselors, um, you know, finding each other and, and, and sort of um, figuring out. And Jim described all of this to me just in the parking lot, you know, that this experience of, of freedom, like um, empowered people to um, realize, you know, that the, that the, the oppression that they faced and that it, it sparked um, activism and people like Judy Human, who was a counselor, and that he thought there was some kind of connection between that profound experience of liberation and this exodus of people who came out to Berkeley and started the Center for Independent Living. And, and that, for me as a filmmaker who, um, you know, has done a lot of films around social justice, but also history, I was so intrigued by the idea of this, like, really intimate, universal, fun, wild lens into a history that we didn't know much about. So I started researching, you know, the 504 sit-in and the things that came later and, um, and got very excited um, about the opportunity of, of trying to tell the story with Jim. Amazing, amazing. So could you talk a bit about the development process, how, you know, you got the film off the ground and then the process of production, especially thinking about, 
you know, how you approach crafting your narrative and, you know, how you thought about using archive, given that it's a very rare, unusual, intriguing combination of, of different kinds of material in the film. I mean, what, what, one of the things I have to say is, <clears throat> you know, the film is full of this incredible black and white video from 1971. We didn't know if it existed when we started working. I, I had had this dim memory of this, this group of hippies with this really early technology of portable video coming to our camp. And that in fact, they'd actually strapped a tape deck to the handlebars of my push chair and gave me a camera. And I had, the, somebody pushed me around the camp as I did a tour. But so we were starting off thinking maybe we could do recreations with actors of the camp. Um, and then the call <laughs> to track them down. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, to just to be able to um, to unearth that footage of Camp Jeanette and to find out that there was five and a half hours of it and to to meet the guys who had shot it, who were just it turned out just a few hours away from us, you know and had made the film um, out of this kind of movement of early video makers in the 70s who were really trying to empower communities by going into them and film it, filming them and showing them back to the communities themselves in this kind of like pop-up street theater fashion, you know? And they had just stumbled upon the camp um, at a gas station one day. And, um, and so, you know, to have Jim kind of reemerge 50 years later and come in and say, I, I now want to take this footage and, and tell this story was just very profound for all of us. And we were so, um, you know, grateful and, and I guess fortunate that they were willing to partner with us and give us access to all of all of that footage and, and believed that we could, um, you know, do it justice. Wow. But uh, I, sorry, I just wanted to add that, you know, when we started, we didn't know that we were going to be able to um, to create a universe in which the viewer was going to be able to immerse themselves in that experience of the camp, but then also find the people from the camp in the news footage that extended um, throughout the 70s and up to this kind of culminating moment where, um, you know, the, the ADA is passed. And that was like years of hunting for material that had been very neglected and kind of hidden in a lot of archives because this history had really not been celebrated or archived or considered in the way that it ought to have been um, throughout history. And, and that was a sometimes frustrating, but like incredibly rewarding process where we were finding, you know, these tapes would come in to the edit room and we would find, you know, one, one camper and there she is in her apartment with her attendant living independently and asking her attendant for candy and ice cream. And we didn't even know what had happened to her because she had passed away and, you know, but she was a, a pivotal character in the, in the camp scene. And, and so just making those connections and kind of almost like, it almost felt like detective work kind of proving Jim's original thesis from that first conversation, which was that, you know, this, this experience really was connected. And I think in um, that is, was something very exciting to be able to use the medium of documentary film to do, because I think there's so many times there are these kind of ephemeral, powerful things that send ripple effects like that throughout history, but you don't always have the opportunity of actually, you know, seeing them and following them over time. And that's, that's the sort of, that's what documentary should be, right? That process of discovery and being able to put all those pieces together and have the resources and the opportunity and the time and the collaborative spirit to do that. That sounds like quite a joyful process, even though any any filmmaking is, is, is so hard. It sounds like the joy from that discovery kind of infused the film um, and that they, you know, that you can really feel that on screen, I would say. Um, so you talked about the sort of, you know, the, the community and representing particularly people who have since passed away, but who, as you said, have become major characters and, and major sort of have had major roles in the film. Can you talk a little bit, actually let's, let's have a look at a clip and then we'll talk about how you approach sort of creating a portrait of the community and representing the range of voices and we can talk about the hierarchy of disability and the sort of accessible approach that you took with the film as well. Let's watch the Denise hierarchy clip. <laughs> Hi, 
<laughs> it's one of my favorite things hearing you yell for <laughs> So yeah, let's, could you tell me a bit about approaching that idea of creating a portrait of a community and how to think about those hierarchies and, and how to really represent everybody in an authentic way? Do you want to go first, Nicole? No, no, no go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I, I, I have to tell you that there's so many incredible things that happened to me in, uh, around disability and my own Kind of internalized ableism and such, and I, my education started at Camp Jeanette. And so, and one of the things that I've really learned is that the disability community has an incredibly wide umbrella. And, and, um, and that's been a really a very important lesson for me to have. And, you know, Denise and Neil are, are I've been very fortunate to have known them, and they live very close to where uh, Nicole and I live in Oakland. And, and really understanding kind of, you know, when you have a disability affected speech and what's, you know, and really kind of what the, um, you know, how that affects one's life. And um, so, um, but I think we take lessons from people in the film and, and we did. And that when you, you know, there's this scene uh, where we're all around a table and we call it message to parents and Nancy Rosenblum uh, is speaking and she's not easy to understand. Here you got a bunch of teenagers, young adults listening, waiting for her to finish. And, um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, I mean, the, you know, and I think that's, that's kind of what we learned, you know, at that place. Yeah, we, we tried to take that spirit try and take that culture that you really see, I think, forming, what you see forming at, you know, and then that scene is, um, is, is really like, uh, I think, you know, I don't know if it's the beginning, because I'm sure it was happening all over the place for a long periods of time before that, but it's, um, at least for this group of people, kind of the beginning of coming together. Judy, Judy Human, um, you know, this legendary activist who's featured in the film calls it coming together to go apart, and she thinks it's a really, really important thing for people to do. But it's also that patience and that understanding and that idea that like, I don't, because we have, you know, different disabilities and different experiences, but share a similar um, experience of oppression. I'm not going to say that I know what your experience is. I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to believe you. And we tried to bring that into the edit room and into the filmmaking team and the filmmaking process, along with really trying to take the spirit of like, letting um, people ask for whatever accommodations they needed, whether they identified as disabled or not, um, in order to be able to bring their full selves into the edit room. Um, and so that ethos was really important, as well as it was really important for us that the film represent this idea of disability as community and culture, um, which was one of the things that had struck me the most about getting to spend time with Jim over the decades that we were working together prior to this. And I, I think we, one of the inspirations we had was the uh, documentary, The Times of Harvey Milk, which is such a beautiful example of a community telling kind of a seminal story um, to itself and the audience kind of feeling like they're invited into that. And that was the film that kind of made me want to become a documentary filmmaker. And we wanted to see if we could bring some of that spirit into the telling of the story. So that clip that you just showed where you can hear Jim laughing in the background. I mean, we don't necessarily, the audience doesn't necessarily know that's Jim at that point, but it has that, that warmth and that feeling of kind of people talking to each other with some common understanding. And so that point of view was really important to us. And initially we had Jim as a narrator, first person narrator, and the film was much more being thought of as kind of a, a personal documentary. Um, but we realized that that was kind of getting in the way of us giving that sense of this being a community held and community told story. So we decided to put Jim on camera. And, um, and when we did that, because Jim had been the person that people were, who people were speaking to um, during the interviews, um, we had Denise come in um, and sit next to the camera. So Jim was talking to her so that it, it has that kind of feeling of a closed circle like, like that conversation Jim was describing. Incredible. Thank you for talking about that. Um, do you want to 
can I mention one thing is that as folks would see in that clip, we, we went to, we really wanted to have the captioning or subtitles for Denise and Neil and anybody else who had a disability affected speech to not be utilitarian, but really part of the artistic presentation of our film. And you can see that kind of in the font and you can kind of see that about where the words are placed on the screen and when they come up and making sure that we're not giving away the joke ahead of like Neil talking. And, um, and you know, it, this is an aspect of dealing with disability or thinking about it is that when you think of things like accommodations and things that you might have to consider, don't think about it as something you have to do. Thinking about it as something you want to do. Why wouldn't you want this to be beautiful and, and really, uh, um, you know, very much part of um, your film. And the same thing, Nicole and I worked very hard um, um, on the uh, audio description script to make sure that, you know, that A, it was accurate and that B, it had our feel. And sometimes filmmakers don't think that that's terribly important. It's part of your film. Absolutely. I think what you really demonstrate in the film with, if you're not watching it with captions or with audio description, in, in how the captions are handled when people are trying to understand somebody's speech. And so there aren't captions yet. The very sensitive way that you've handled that, but also the additional layers of the audio description and the captions. I use captions for everything and they're rich and real and the timing's beautiful. And you know that's an opportunity for all of us, I think, as filmmakers, you really demonstrate that this is a creative process, not just this thing you throw on at the end for some people who you haven't really thought about that much. It's, it's a part of the storytelling. I think you've really conveyed that beautifully. You know, Netflix was really quite remarkable to work with, I have to say, and that our film uh, has um, a greater number of audio descriptions in different languages and captioning than they've ever done before. And there's also on the, the website for our film, there's a script for people who are deafblind that they can download so that they can experience the film. That feels like good timing to talk about what's it been like to work with Netflix on this? And obviously everybody I'm sure asks you what it's been like to work with President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. What's, how's, how's that been for you both? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, the, the partnerships came together kind of at the same time. We had started talking with Netflix and then um, Higher Ground, the Obama's production company in partnership with Netflix um, was formed and Priya Swami Nathan was hired um, to, to run that effort. And we were able to get a, a trailer, sort of a fundraising trailer to her. And, uh, and so she called us up about a week later and said, I don't know what's going on, but I just keep watching this over and over and over again. <laughs> and um, and she asked us sort of what our aspirations for the project were. And she recognized, I think, the kind of like unusual hybrid of, you know, um, a really entertaining um, kind of iconoclastic documentary plus like a very important untold story from history. And, um, and was intrigued. So she uh, flew up and spent a, a day with us in the edit room. And um, she, we talked a lot about kind of, you know, the values um, that mattered to um, her bosses, um, President Obama and Mrs. Obama, and then and how they dovetailed with the film, you know, the sort of like um, grassroots organizing and the, uh, the, the story of like a small group of young people being able to change the world, et cetera. And also Judy Human had actually worked in the State Department with President Obama, so um, she, the, you know that was exciting to them as well. And by the end of the day, Priya said to us something that really touched us and made us convinced that we wanted to partner with them, which was she said, um, I, "I think you have a culture-changing project." And Jim wrote that down and put it on the wall because we were starting to get really positive response to the documentary and we were starting to believe that for ourselves you know it takes a while for you to get to that point with a film where you sort of have that confidence that um that it can actually happen that way and so as she called us from the parking lot actually of that meeting and said um we really want to partner with you and the president and mrs obama feel the same way 
and they they have been incredible partners along with alongside Netflix, really embracing this opportunity to do something different and do it better in regards to how disability is represented and, and around accessibility and. Um, and President Obama and Mrs. Obama watched three cuts of the film and gave feedback. We were like, really? They want to watch our rough cut, you know, <laughs> like messy rough cut. And I remember Priya said, uh, you're going to get some presidential notes and they're going to be from a perspective of like somebody who's only the only person on the planet that's got that perspective, um, which was true. And it was just it was just a like really I mean, you you mentioned uh, joyful, you know, earlier that it seemed as though the process was joyful. It really was. It really was. And the partnership with with them was was as well. So. Sounds sounds magic. Let's um, let's watch a clip, and I, then I'd like to ask you a bit about the sort of personal demands of making a film like this, because it you know it is very intense. There are moments of vulnerability, I think, for lots of people involved. So let's watch the cost of staying clip. So how did you approach the sort of the intensity of of that subject matter um, as as co-directors, you know, in your collaboration, and and how you crafted your relationship together? Trust. Trust was a huge word. Um, um, I mean, we had a, so I, I just, I can, I want to just speak personally because I'm in the film and um, that um, I revealed some very personal things about myself, but I so trusted the process that Nicole and I were in with between us, our collaboration and with our editors, that, um, that if in the long run, if I was uncomfortable with something, there was an option for me to pull it out of the film or ask to have it pulled out of the film. But, um, but I also trusted in uh, what we were making was really going to be worth that it was going to add so much to the film. Yeah, I mean, it's seeing that clip. It's it's such a perfect example, I think, of of the kind of fruits of our collaboration. Um, I mean, you've got that incredible narration of Jim's, which is um, which is so beautiful and indicative of the fact that he had to show up every day and like be willing to put himself emotionally on the line. Also, think from a kind of um, you know, creative perspective. Um, also trust all these people who didn't understand the experience, the lived experience that he had. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was very intense. And, um, and then you have that uh, line from Corbett. Um, and, you know, Corbett said to Jim, when we showed up at her house, she said, I, <laughs> that interview was amazing, actually. She said, she was joking around and she said, um, Jim, do they usually, when they come to film you, do they usually film you uh, getting dressed and getting out of bed? That's what they always want to film, you know, um, which was very eye-opening to me because I've, I see that all the time and I had never really thought about what it would feel like to, to, to be asked to do that um, in terms of how disability is often represented. And then she said, you know, I wouldn't be talking to you like this if you if it weren't for you Jim you know I'm basically I'm giving you this interview because you're a member of the community but then it was you know I was there too and and folks trusted me because of my closeness to Jim and um and I was the blunderer I was the person kind of wandering into disability community for the first time and trying to get my bearings which is what we wanted the audience to experience in the film we wanted especially that whole first part of the camp part to to, to have that feeling for people that they could, they would come in, they would make mistakes, they would, um, you know, uh, recognize their own bias um, and recognize their own discomfort and have to confront it, but then feel pulled, pulled along, you know, so by the time the movement part happens, you're on, you feel on board and you feel part of it and you don't feel like you're watching what disabled people did, you feel like you're watching what your friends did. And, um, and so I remember uh, that line that you just heard from Corbett, I, I asked her, I said, to what extent was anger motivating you? And she was pissed off at me. She said, 
you can hear in that clip, she says, if you want to call that anger, I call that drive because she was recognizing, you know, my, what I didn't understand about that moment. And so I feel like that is um, one of the things I love about the film is I feel like it, it really has some of that, um, some of that like tension um, and some of the um, like well-roundedness of having both, both of our perspectives and the, and the close way we work together. So there's actually there's vulnerability on both of your parts there and holding that together and making a safe space for that together is what yields all these different beautiful layers in the film. It's a really, I think that's a really useful lesson for filmmakers where, you know, when we're thinking about how to craft a co-directing relationship or, you know, what it takes to tell a story that's so personal. Um, yeah, those are sort of really useful takeaways. Um, so obviously the film's been really well received. Um, you won the Audience Award at Sundance earlier this year, and you've just been nominated this week for six Critics' Choice Awards, I believe, including one for the legendary Judy Human. Um, so congratulations to all of you. <laughs> let's show another clip, and then let's talk about impact, the impact of the film, the way that it's landed with people, the way that people are using the film, um, and your incredible impact team led by Stacey Park Milburn and Andrea Levant. So let's look at a clip involving a special guest. Welcome back, Crip Campers, and a huge hello to President Barack Obama. Hello, everybody, and hello, Andrea. I was hoping to see if there were going to be any s'mores. I guess virtually that's hard to do. One of the first films that we were lucky enough to be able to produce was Crip Camp. It was so moving to us to see all these young people, teenagers at Camp Jeanette who, who left camp believing they could lead a worldwide movement, finding their voice and awakening to their power. Bringing the Crip Camp story to life means so much to our community. What I want to do is hear from you about what camp's been like. Now, you have joined us on our sixth week of Crit Camp. Hi, everyone. This is We're continuing the work you see in the film with leaders of today's movement. Always like to start with the spirit of gratitude. We have over 8,500 people registered to join us for camp each week from all over the world. Making sure everyone feels included is our priority. This includes folks who are deaf and hard of hearing. Image description, okay. And blind and low vision. A dress with a black top. I have heart-shaped glasses. Short curly hair. I'm wearing a denim shirt. There's a picture of me swimming in Hawaii, which is where I was born. My hair is much grayer than it was just a few years ago. <laughs> so tell us a bit about the impact um, and your amazing team and, and what the film's been doing in the world since the release. Do you want to start, Jim? I, I, uh, I mean, almost immediately when we played at Sundance, shortly thereafter, we started getting a sense that there was impact our film was having in that, um, there had been a screening. Uh, uh, the local politicians in Utah could choose one film at Sundance that they would all come to, and they chose Crip Camp. And we heard later that uh, like a county commissioner says, we have to take a second look at our transportation services for the disabled. You know, it was just starting conversations, and that's really wanted the film to do. Um, but the the really the hugest impact. Um, I think our film has had is with our impact campaign and 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 how we um, thankfully were able to hand it off to two incredible women. You want to pick it up in there, Nicole? Sure. We we you know we we wanted to develop a um, an impact campaign that was um, you know really uh, co-created with a broad group of people from the disability community from the beginning. And so we, we had this huge brain trust with all of these really diverse, really incredible kind of artists and activists and advocates, um, you know, from all over uh, the country and, and a couple of folks internationally. 
And, um, and we, we asked people like, what do you think is the most important thing that this film could do? And to be honest, we had, um, we had thought that we were gonna hear about policy um, positions and, and, and issues that people thought the film could be used to make leverage, to, to, to gain leverage around. And we were really surprised that that was not at all what we heard back. What we heard back was actually there's still a really a need for uh, people to come together in the way that they come, came together at Camp Jeanette. Um, and for people to find community and for people to, um, to, to, to use the film as kind of an on-ramp into disability community. Um, and that, you know, that, that those spaces, that if we could create spaces for people to come together, both virtually and physically, um, you know, that that would be something really great. And so we started planning, focused mostly on the kind of like physical coming together, a bunch of really incredible things. Um, we, we had a kind of um, aha moment um, you know, right around the time the film uh, went to Sundance, which was we couldn't um, we couldn't run the campaign in kind of a traditional documentary way we, with outside consultants who are specialists in running documentary impact campaigns. We realized we really did have to give this campaign over to people, um, activists from the community, and it was really important to us that they be activists from the disability justice movement which um, has this core tenet of prioritizing the leadership and, and voices of people who've been marginalized within the, the disability community. Like, so people who are most impacted and multiply marginalized um, BIPOC queer voices within the community. And, um, and we had, as Jim said, these incredible uh, activists design this campaign. And when the, um, when the pandemic hit, um, they pivoted really fast and really creatively and, and amazingly to this idea of this 16 week virtual session that you just saw the clip of. And um, it was so great because it was just this like, um, also just this great example of, um, you know, why it's important that's, that uh, so many more things be disability led <laughs> because the kind of ingenuity, creativity, thinking outside the box, like responding to a world that isn't, you know, built for you um, was just so evidenced in the way they planned this thing so quickly. And then also iterated it across time to become more and more and more accessible because we had, they thought there were going to be 500 people signing up for it and there were 10,000 people by the end of it. And, and people with all different kinds of disabilities and different access needs. And so people were writing in and going, this is great, but it actually is messing up with my screen reader that you're using the Q&A on the side of the Zoom. So then they had to figure out a solve for that, you know, um, and just on and on and on with this sort of adaptation and spirit of inclusivity. Um, so that, that has been really incredible to see. Amazing, thank you. So we've got, about 20, 30 minutes left. I'm going to ask a couple of last questions and then we'll go to questions from everyone in the room. Um, you know, this film, it's, it's been said by many people at this stage, is, is a culture changing film and it's part of a continuum of culture changing films about world changing civil rights movements. Um, and, you know, Camp Jeanette empowered an entire generation to be themselves, to be whole to be seen and part of what I've seen you both do in our filmmaking community is empower other filmmakers, particularly filmmakers from underrepresented communities to be themselves and to be whole and to be seen as well. You've both spent many years working to support representation and equity both on and off screen. So maybe I'll, we'll stick with two questions. <laughs> what does it mean to you for audiences and, your, and the community and also for filmmakers that a story like this has been supported to be told authentically and respectfully. Um, that isn't always what happens in our field. So what's it meant to you to kind of watch the Im impact of that over the last several months? Well, I think the proof is kind of in the pudding, so to speak, in regards to authenticity. And that's the word. I mean, you know, we, we had a couple of like, things besides this culture changing project up on the walls of our living room. One of them was community, the word community. And the other one right by the editing monitor was uh, the power of Steve. Steve Hoffman, who's in the film, who is just an extraordinary um, person and just had this incredible um, spirit 
So I, I mean, I think that those are the things we, we, we you know, we, we certainly really kind of, you know, held on to. Um, I think I'm going a little off the rails here, so Nicole, help me out. <laughs> I you? mean, we, we, you know, I've made other fil other documentaries um, kind of in partnership with communities around stories that were really important to marginalized communities that they that they surface. But I had never co-directed um, a, a film with with a member of one of those communities, and it was very eye opening to me to see the difference. Um, because every single step, every single frame, every single scene is informed by by Jim's lived experience, um, you know, and and my perspective. But but that um, that process was so rich and and so um, I think what what one of my big takeaways was that it helped us do what isn't always completely obvious and is sometimes very hard to do, which is if you're trying to tell a story against this huge kind of misperception and huge overwhelming bias against a community, I don't think you can actually effectively figure out how to, how to plow through that, those layers of, of, of bias and misperception without that kind of informed experience. So we, that was for us. I mean, figuring out how to tell the story was one thing, but figuring out how to tell it in a way that didn't trigger everybody's, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, we are just trained to think about disability as kind of either like, oh my God, it's inspirational or, oh God, it's tragic, you know, and people to the point where our brains just go into these tracks or ruts, I think, around those two stereotypes. And so, um, so we would we would show a, a cut that maybe had like a, a, a music cue that was like the slightest bit, you know, over modulated in one direction or another, and Jim would just be like, eh, you know, <laughs> it, was like, it was almost like a compass needle of that that kind of authentic lived experience, you know. And sometimes it would take us like uh, two or three months to figure out why something wasn't sitting well, you know. But, but eventually we would, and we just kept working until we did. And so, um, so for, for me, it's very meaningful to see that this film is being um, thought of as an example around, how, uh, around authenticity and representation in, in the way that it is. Brilliant. Someone's actually asked a question, which I think comes up a lot when we discuss this sort of topic. They've said, um, do you think all films should be directed and or co-directed by people with personal connections to the story being told? It's a very hot topic right now in the in documentary world. And we're in an extraordinary moment in time. And um, I would like to think that um, any filmmaker um, can make a film without any subject, but it's really what you come into it and how you respect and how you really engage with any community that is not your own. That really, I think, is part of the answer to that question. And so I, Nicole. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that um, it's true we're at a moment where it's so important that, that people get the platforms and the microphones who haven't had them, you know? And then there, on top of that, there's the, the truth and art, which is that when people have a powerful emotional um, connection to a topic and and something you know a, a unique um, and and um, Im important thing to say about it, then those are the those are the things that resonate with people. And that sometimes is that you are a member of that community, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's some other emotional way way in that you have, or some relationship that you have to the topic that's that's uh, powerful and extraordinary. You know. Um, and right now, I think we're kind of um, seeing something exciting, which is that we're, we are, because there is an effort to um, pass the microphone and, and, and cede the platforms to, to people who, who haven't had an opportunity before, we're finding all of these like really powerful artistic perspectives, not just like, oh, here's somebody finally who has this, this particular identity is telling a story, but we're, we're discovering all kinds of um, 
artists we didn't have the opportunity to know about before. Absolutely. Um, somebody in the audience has asked, and please do feel free to post your questions in the Q&A section. Um, they've asked, Jim and Nicole, do you have any plans to work together on other films in the future? <laughs> We're cooking up a really um, fun project that we can't really talk about right now that's related to, to Crip Camp together that um, that we're both very excited about. And then we're, we're both kind of also, um, you know, looking at, at uh, individual projects. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> so for everybody, you know, here today who's, who's part of this conversation, whether they're in the film industry or beyond, how would you like them to I mean, it's tricky because as you said, the proof is in the pudding, but how would you like them to do things differently, particularly in the film industry going forward, having watched a film like Crip Camp and, and really having seen a new way of, of understanding representation of disability in particular? I wonder if we could talk about our kind of our ethos of how we made the film, the process that made relate a little bit to what you're talking about here, Lindsay, in that really looking at the precepts, um, you know, as basically we wanted to try to make a film in a way that first off, there was no charity model here. Everybody got paid. We weren't saying, oh, please, let's do it for the kids. You know, it's like every, you know, we had that ability, which was very, very fortunate. But also it came down to say, look, you know, the accommodations aren't simply things that people with disabilities need, nor do we always know whether someone actually has maybe a hidden disability. And so being respectful of what people's needs are um, was really, really important. And that, um, and, and it kind of played itself out. And I, I had had a conversation recently with somebody and we were kind of talking about accommodations and I said, you know, accommodations for any employee could be simply, could I get the next five Friday afternoons off so I can go to my kid's soccer game? And that is no different than saying I need a table and a space that's wheelchair accessible. It allows me to do my job as best as possible. And to do so healthily. And sustainably right you've talked yeah. before we've all talked before about um a sort of culture of a stamina in the film industry could you talk a little bit about that well there's this notion that you have to prove yourself um to like get your foot or wheel in the door here right <laughs> and so you got to be this you know intern or this production assistant that will stay up till four in the morning and that's how you prove that you're dedicated that filters out so many good people. That's not the measure of dedication. The dedication, the measure of that dedication is how well you can do your job. But when you try to have things that involve stem, 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 stamina or time, you make that impossible for people who are, let's say, single parents, or you're making it impossible for people who, let's say, um, you know, for which, um, you know, stamina is just um, something they they have to manage their lives very carefully. You know, someone with, with diabetes has to make sure they're eating and testing their blood and, and you know, all these things that you just need to do. So, you know, there, there there's this thing in which a lot of job descriptions, even nowadays, are like, you know, for a job, you've got to be able to lift a 25 pound box of photocopy paper. And that's a way for them to legally exclude people with disabilities who can't lift that. And it's, it's BS. Anybody can help lift that paper. Nicole, is there anything you'd like to add or should we move to the, the next question? Um, just one thing, which is that I think also what I hope Crip Camp is helping do along with so many other exciting projects that are emerging now out of this from artists with disabilities is, you know, I hope people are starting to see disability as not, not you know, 
not just something that requires accommodation, but also perspectives that are incredibly valuable, rich and entertaining and, and, um, and unique in a way that's really valuable to, um, to the creation of, of, of art and culture. And, um, and I think that we, we have experienced that, you know, personally, we've experienced a real shift just from when we started working on the project to the, com to the kinds of conversations we have now in the industry where people are, are kind of seeking that and curious about it and interested in it. And so um, that, that's something I'd like to see more of too. Absolutely. Someone um, has asked, or someone said, this is such an important film and such an important film for children to see. Are mm -hmm. there any plans for school screenings? Yeah, we have um, been working with uh, some folks also from the disability justice uh, uh, space to create some really incredible um, curriculum uh, to go along with the film, which you can access it um, in at cripcamp.com, our website. Um, and we're also gonna, that it's a very extensive um, uh, curriculum that's geared towards sort of high school students, but we're also trying to make a kind of, you know, stripped down one because the film is R rated. Um, which, you know, we debated, uh, should we leave um, Neil and Denise's salty language in? They were, they were fighting at one point over who, <laughs> who had contributed more uh, F-bombs to the film and um, uh, was responsible for our, our rating. Um, but, you know, we felt it was really important to include um, the references to sexuality and stories around sexuality and the, and the language that we did because we really wanted to um, to, to have a kind of like, um, you know, uh, feeling of the sort of like punk spirit of uh, disability culture. And, um, and it was important to us to show, to show all, that, all of that. Um, but we are gonna um, make a kind of more streamlined curriculum that has clips from the film. Um, and we're aware of many, many school screenings already. You know, it's showing in many, many, uh, we've, Jim and I have been on, uh, in Zoom conversations on many college campuses, but we've also been hearing back from lots of people who have folded it into their, um, you know, high school and college curriculum and history classes and all of that. So um, we, we totally agree. And one of our goals is that it can just play a role in, um, disability civil rights history being included in textbooks and just kind of in the in the canon of what what kids are taught about civil rights history um, in the United States. Um, someone's asked about how the industry can do more to create a level playing field and it's a big old question um, and I wondered if you might want to talk about some of the organizations in the documentary field for example that are working on on that. <laughs> and the ones that have inspired these organizations, you know. <laughs> well, funny you should ask. Uh, I, I, I kid and, and joke here because um, both Lindsay and I um, are founding members um, of a, a group called Forward Doc, FWD-DOC, and we have a website. Um, I'm sure they'll put into the, uh, into the chat here. And it is a group of filmmakers and allies uh, promoting uh, documentary filmmakers with disabilities. And this is an incredible kind of outgrowth of uh, the International Documentary Association has a biannual conference. And in 19, uh, 19, <laughs> 2018, um, there was a panel on filmmakers with disabilities working in the doc space. And afterwards we had a convening and there, um, for the first time, many filmmakers with disabilities met for the first time someone else in that situation. We, uh, so we started Forward Doc really at, in, in, and our inspiration was ADOC, Asian filmmakers, and uh, Brown Girls Doc Mafia. And these are people who, you know, would see each other on kind of, you know, on the, on the festival circuit and say, let's get together and, and work for, our own benefit. So, you know, that is one of, you know, the things that I think that it's happening in the industry. And um, I think finally we're really seeing that when discussions are happening around diversity and inclusion, that disability is not being left out nearly as much. Well, it was always left out just a couple of years ago. And, um, and, I, and we're seeing that it's really 
um, it's really now um, part of the conversation. Um, um, and in fact, the, the Academy, um, you know, there's a post here to this uh, video here, but the Motion Picture Academy has done a lot of work recently. And Sundance has been really extraordinary in the last uh, couple of years. Um, once they really understood how people like myself with mobility issues were not having opportunities there to participate fully. Um, so things are, things are changing. We still have a very long way to go because the misrepresentation and the underrepresentation of people in film is a huge problem. And so what the industry needs to do is to look at how they have uh, addressed the needs of women filmmakers and, and minority filmmakers and say, you know, we need to apply the same programs and, and initiatives for people with disabilities. And I don't believe it's as hard as maybe they might think it is. I think that if when you don't see it, you don't think it's possible. But we're out there. You just like you need to kind of like, you know, look for us. We're not that hard to find. Leaving us, we're not unicorns. <laughs> no, no, no. And and look, and if we've gotten to your door, you know, you know, we've gone through many hurdles just to get there. Um, and you know, and you, we, Nicole, and you and I could talk for hours just about the advantages of having a disability. What? <laughs> It sort of reminds me of what Judy says in the film, which I remember that the first time I watched it was something I wrote down and I'm, I'm sure that happens for lots of people. She says, if you don't respect yourself and if you don't demand what you believe in for yourself, you're not gonna get it. And I think that's part of what filmmakers from marginalized communities are doing for themselves and also what we can all do for each other. Um, I think that's part of what Crip Camp demonstrates. You know, you, you've talked, both of you very compellingly in the past about how um, you know, disability cuts across many identities. And this isn't just a film about disability, it's a film about many kinds of living, many kinds of experience, emotion, relationships, sex, fun, pain, struggle, joy. It's, you know, it's all of those things. Um, and so if we don't have any more questions, that might be a really nice place to pause, just with, a, you know, enormous thanks for this extraordinary story that you've told. Um, and for the new ways that I think, you know, that Crip Camp is, is clearly helping people think and feel about themselves and other people in the world. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? I don't think so. Thank you so much. It was great to talk about this with you. Me too. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. And I really want to thank the festival for inviting us. And I, I got to tell you, I really wish we were able to travel because this is one of the festivals that is absolutely so dear to our community. So anyway, thank you. So thank you so much to Nicole and to Jim for this brilliant chance to spend time with you and, and hear about your experiences and the incredible things you've created. Um, thank you to our live captioner, Inga, for making this event accessible. To Netflix, Higher Ground, and to Sheffield.best, thank you for having us and making this possible. And thank you all for coming. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.